Welcome to Coffee with the Maestro with Mark Bailey and Kevin Sherwin. And Mark Bailey is drinking coffee. I'm currently drinking tea this morning. You know, I actually don't like that term maestro very much. Even oh, I though know. that's what's funny. About I know the that's title. what, yeah. and I appreciate the the uh, that's what's you funny. know the compliment. But right, it, that's that's a title that. I'm, I uh, actually never asked to be called. So why don't you like that yeah. title? Because I think that's telling about your approach to conducting. Yeah, I just um, feel that it's such an aggrandized uh, term that makes the conductor uh, singular and implies that he's being placed above uh, the musicians that he works with um, as... I think you know, I believe very much in the collaborative spirit. I'm the coordinator of that collaborative spirit. I have to ensure that our voices all come together, whether they're literal voices or instrumental voices, uh, so that the music speaks coherently and expressively to an audience. Uh, but I do that as one of among many terrific musicians. And uh, I don't, something about being singled out with a special term like maestro. Uh, as if there's something that's descended upon me and only me um, that is mysterious and unattainable by others. Uh, and, you know, I'm exaggerating right now. But uh, that's kind of why I never use the term with myself or never encourage it that it be used. Although if someone calls me maestro, of course, I'm, I graciously appreciate it and uh, go along with it. I think that mysterious description, an unattainable description, is actually part of the historical understanding of the conductor of like the late 19th and early 20th century, that that mm -hmm. was part of how that conductor was perceived. Obviously, it probably had to do with, you know, very kind of dictatorial political culture, you know, something that it's I good think that so we haven't too. carried forward. Yeah, know. I also think, and at the risk of sounding a bit cynical or overcritical that um, some conductors may have even cultivated that sort of maestro mystique yeah. sort of thing to cover for their insecurities, to cover for things that they didn't do particularly well um, as an excuse for it, uh, as an excuse for the tirades, as an excuse for yelling at an orchestra for doing something that, that he didn't show properly in his technique. Um, but, you know, they have this mystique and, and sort of live on a plane above everyone else. I, I thoroughly reject all that. I don't think that's very helpful. Um, so I don't think I ever call anybody maestro, you know. Um, I, I, I wouldn't do that. So speaking of not calling people maestros. Yes. On this episode of Coffee with the Maestro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yes. <laughs> To yeah. talk about, we wanted to talk about um, the basic technical foundation um, that anyone who wants to go and conduct yeah. needs to right. practically rehearse and direct an ensemble in concert. Yeah, there are a few essential factors. Uh, we talked about the role of uh, dance in cultivating body movement, and we can talk some more about that. But um, if you were to force me to boil it down to one thing, you were to say, what's that one critical factor that we either will make or break uh, a conductor that has to be there? Um, it's the ears. Mm -hmm. Ears, 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 exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And of the conductors I've seen, of the students I've seen who uh, aspire to be conductors, actually, usually it comes down to one thing that will either open the doors to a profession in conducting or close that door, and it's the quality of their ears. And if I see someone struggling to hear things, uh, and we'll talk about what that means, is struggling that way, it's just, it's not going to work. Um, the ears are extraordinarily important and they have to be there already to a certain extent uh, when you get up in front of an ensemble again or it's not going to work. The good news is um, ears can be cultivated, ears can develop, ears can go from being okay to being extraordinary with a lot of hard work and that hard work is worth it. 
So what's that hard work? Like if I were to ask, I'm going to practice an hour a day on my ears, you know, because we practice an instrument. Mm -hmm. How do you practice on your ears? But I'm going to say, I'm going to practice an hour a day on my ears. What would you say? Would it be a traditional ear training regimen? Well, I think before, in order to answer that question, um, we have to talk a little bit about what is the purpose of having, you know, your ears uh, incredibly well developed. What what are we trying to achieve through that? And I think there are several levels to it. Um, most typically, people are going to think about sort of the ear jock type things that you are able to hear intervals and all that, and that certainly is critical important, critically important. Okay, so you do have to master. That. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, you, if you're in front of an orchestra and you can't hear even the most micro bit of out of tune playing. Um, or you, it's certainly if you can't recognize that they're playing wrong notes or wrong rhythms that your ear can't perceive that at the most detailed and subtle level you're not serving the music well you're not serving them yeah. well they can't I mean they can hear some of it but just because of where the instrumentalists are sitting as opposed to where you stand as a conductor you're the one who can detect these things you're the ones who can and who can actually fix it right away your ear is or what notice that? I mean, sometimes you might see an expression on someone's face that gives it away, but you know, seriously, it's it's your ears that are telling you this isn't right, and that's okay. That's basic ear work, where you have to get to as a conductor to know what's not right about it, mm-hmm. what's not right, um, playing in a wrong transposition position again a rhythm a, a note that's overshooting the interval all these sorts of things um, and it has to go beyond equal temperament it has to go to uh, natural tuning and uh, being able to hear pure thirds and pure fifths, fifths and know how all of that works uh, we can talk about uh, the whole fallacy of um, you know, um, perfect pitch at some point as well. Uh, but yes, you, you absolutely have to be able to hear all of that. But that's only one part of it. There also is the component of musical imagination mm. and being able to hear musical possibilities in your mind and to make that a reality. I think, that to me, that's a form of hearing as well. Um, to be able to understand the possibilities of the music based on the instruments and the voices in front of you. And the only way you can imagine it is because you've learned to listen to music in a very detailed way, in a very thorough way, that your ears have picked up not only the sound, but how the sound is being able to produ- how the sound is being produced that you're able to hear how a singer is breathing in order to make a certain phrase uh, come out, right? That you actually can hear that and you hear how much time it takes and you you hear um, any other aspect of it. And that hearing allows you, your imagination to be realistic in the musical possibilities before you. Um, So it's, it's ears at all kinds of levels from Again, this, this level of musical imagination to the most detailed level of hearing what happens to a sound when it's being played in the wrong part of the bow and, and knowing it should be in another part of the bow, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. If a conductor isn't willing to do the work to develop those skills at the highest level, that person uh, has no right in front of the ensemble, choral, orchestral, or combined so what's what's that work? Because in my experience, it's it, I ask this question because it's a very difficult question because mm-hmm. the traditional approaches of say an ear training class in a conservatory aren't at all um, enough no, to not. be effective on the podium. And even there are many composers who have incredible ears in terms of what they can compose. Mm-hmm. When you place them in front of live instruments in a live rehearsal setting, they don't know what is wrong in terms of subtleties of pitch, timbre, or rhythm and how to correct it. So this is it's a very 
a distinct skill set as a conductor. Say for me, I think a lot of work at the keyboard can be very helpful preliminary, pre preliminarily, especially um, to make absolutely solid your skills with harmonies, intervals, um, combining melody, harmony, and rhythm. Mm -hmm. Those need to be very, very solid, as solid as you can make them. But for me, working with the chorus, uh, working with the Yale Russian chorus in particular, was one of the best experiences for my ears because weekly rehearsals entailed correcting and teaching pitch rhythm well you can't and right you can't you can't correct yeah. uh, intonation on a keyboard that's that's the issue right. with only working on a keyboard you're not right. training yourself the keyboard to part is important you're absolutely right about that and pitch yeah yeah being able to combine harmonies and all that and uh, probably you should mention working on a keyboard that allows temperament to just yeah, absolutely right yeah. so that you're not restricted to equal temperament but again electronic keyboard that has a uh, quarter comma mean tone and and you know other things uh, so you can really hear what pure intervals sound like yeah. as well um, yeah that's a really good point and maybe one of the reasons my ears are so strong and you know that's maybe one of two things I'll say with a, a bit of pride um, is because I've you know been working with singers and choirs my whole life yeah I've always yeah. been conducting them alongside of the very uh, instrumental variable absolutely and yeah voice, and, you know. and you know especially the because a lot of the choral conducting I've done since I was 18 or 19 was unaccompanied. Um, uh -huh. And, you know, especially the Slavic, the Eastern European, the, the Ukrainian and Russian uh, liturgical music, which is all in completely unaccompanied. Um, wow, if you're going to make that work, your ears have to be in such good shape because you gotta, you got to keep them where they are and um, where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. and tune those intervals in such a way because if you know catastrophe results otherwise and catastrophe does result often um, because you don't have the instruments uh, where they're gonna you know they're gonna match pitch to those those folks um, so I, I think that's a really good point with with singers it, that's a that's a wonderful way to develop um, yeah. a sense uh, develop the ears to really refine intonation and other things uh, I think to your question, yeah, absolutely any of the skills work that a person can do, um, it's all valuable and it's all worth it. I will say, and this is just an impression, it's not scientific, but I feel like music students um, don't have, their ears aren't as good as they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, and I'm, st I'm not sure why that is. I you know, think back to my fellow students at Eastman and Yale, and our ears were just in much better shape than I find the average students today. So I, I'm not sure what that's all about, um, but it doesn't change the fact that the ears need to be, you know, just developed to this this really extraordinary level to make this work. Beyond the skills, uh, I see, in a sense, you you develop your ears by actually using them. <laughs> and what that means for a student is go to rehearsals mm -hmm. go to an orchestral rehearsal uh, and listen carefully don't just you know listen to what's going on don't focus just on how the conductor is rehearsing or uh, what gestures he or she is using and i agree that's very important but go frequently and simply listen to the ensemble and listen very carefully listen very critically uh, sometimes you bring a score along and compare what are you hearing as compared to what's in the music um, and how is it matching uh, and then put that score away and just listen and absorb and listen and absorb um, with such attention to the detail of sound and you know what your your ears will learn to gravitate toward that level of detailed listening automatically over time mine certainly did I wasn't born with great ears it's it's I, I don't think I was but I worked very hard at them um, and can hear all kinds of things because uh, they pay attention. Absolutely. So first off, the ears are very important for anyone looking to begin conducting. Um, it 
whatever stage in your life. And of course, the more experience you have, say as a, a violinist or, or string player um, or vocalist, you already have quite a big leg up in terms of intonation mm-hmm. because you're constantly mm-hmm. dealing with that and making your own music. And so you want to bring that to the podium. You right. want to bring that sensitivity to the podium. Uh, the second thing that comes to mind that I'd like you to speak on is just the basic preparation of scores and parts for an ensemble yeah. because you instructed me very carefully in how to do this. However, what I've observed various you know orchestras I've worked with or various ensembles, various even chamber music, that the approach to organization of the parts is not nearly as thorough as I was trained in, and it Mm -hmm. makes such a big difference because you end up wasting so much time in rehearsal, and time is our biggest enemy as conductors. We're terribly limited, and we have to make... There's never enough time. Yeah, we have to make every minute, even 30 seconds count, Three so seconds waste, can make a big difference. Yeah, to waste ten minutes in rehearsal could mean yeah. that, you know, ten minutes of the music and the concert is underprepared. And so uh, what what needs to happen for the parts? Because it drives it's me simple. insane. It's simple, it's, but it, quite frankly. not everyone actually knows no. what it is and how important it actually is. Well, it's it's important. It's like anything in life. If you're you know, giving a presentation and handing out reports, you don't want them full of mistakes or incomplete, or having misguided information. Um, this is also something, by the way. I think has also gotten worse. I more than it used to be, and it, it's. I would say, especially in our you know kind of early music circles, that um, the lack of preparation of parts is. Is really can you know kind of astounding and um, can be a bit shameful not to uh, over exaggerate. Um, now I want to be clear when I say preparing parts, I don't mean that you mark in and predetermine every expressive gesture. I actually don't like doing that. As as mm-hmm. you know, you look at my viola parts and that that I use, and you see relatively few fingerings. And, and nothing else. You, in fact, fingers may be all you see. I don't mark up my parts a lot. I leave uh, a lot of it open to the moment. But there are things, uh, the parts have to be organized in certain ways, they have to agree, and they absolutely have to have measure numbers and uh, certain essential bowings and things like that to save mm-hmm. time. And so it's just, it's a matter of absolutely taking care of that and ensuring that because it will save enormous amounts of rehearsal time and it will save rehearsal energy too because if your players and you are trying to agonize over uh, certain details that should already be accounted for in the way the score was prepared then you're taking away from the musical energy to make that piece come to life Um, I this was instilled in me by a very simple story about Dan Lewis uh, told by Dan Lewis. Uh, cool. Again, as I uh, mentioned in our previous episode, one of the great you know, American conducting teachers, uh, one of the world's great conducting teachers of his generation, certainly. And he was telling us that one of his students at USC uh, was scheduled to rehearse uh, a Mozart, I think, piano concerto or something in conducting lab class that day. And... Uh, passed out the parts without having prepared them, without having put in measure numbers and things like that. Um, And she was sent home that day. That was it. Uh, That's how important it is. Something, one should not brush off logistics because it means so much. So you sit down with the parts, you decide you're going to get them out two weeks ahead of time, uh, and... What does it take to do that, and what does it mean? It means that it's simple. It means they have the same measure numbers and rehearsal letters, and you can turn the pages. So you, you make sure that the page turns work. 
Uh, you tape the pages. You tape the pages. You, page, you know, just you, sit there exactly. and coordinate what the page turns are and tape them appropriately. Right. Yeah. It feels almost silly, you know, to, to have to say this, but the number of rehearsals I go to where that's not the case. Um, what was it? There was some project I did where the viola parts were actually choral parts handed out to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was supposed to read. Um, the tenor part, and I mean, the good thing about being a violist is you learn how to read in different clefs because people do that to you. Um, or, in fact, last year I was at a, doing a project, a violist, and at, at the dress rehearsal they handed out a piece of music. Oh, I think we're going to add this for the strings. Um, and looked at me and said, oh, yeah, your part's in treble clef, sorry. Uh, and out of my range. Well, okay, I was able to do it, and I was able to transpose it at sight and all that. But, you know... It you shouldn't the, have to. Yeah, it is the conductor. I was a waste of my energy, and it made me have to scramble an hour before the performance. It is the conductor's responsibility, as you told yeah. me, it is the conductor's responsibility to be fully accountable for yeah. every note that every, every player plays. Absolutely. And if you're fortunate to have players who can go beyond and add this in and add that in and create this, if it's that kind of arrangement like mm -hmm. project that's fantastic but that cannot be the baseline expectation because far from um every instrumentalist has the expectation that you have that expectation right of that, yeah of course you know? and i have to say that i don't think this is an issue uh once you get up to you know the higher professional levels um, there's a library, you know, an orchestra has a librarian that's going to make sure this isn't going to happen and works with the conductor. Uh, but still, you, you need to cultivate this as a, as a young conductor as well because, you know, all the wonderful projects, the startup groups, the, the grassroots initiatives and ensembles, they all deserve to be uh, managed with the same kind of preparation and accountability and organization as anything else. Sure, and I've even heard many stories at the professional level where the conductor doesn't have the same measure numbers or letters that. Oh, the well, that's do. really bad. So yeah, it's someone. I hear this someone needs to get fired. Yeah, but it's just a lack of yeah. attention to the idea that these are really important components. Yeah, and I gotta say, when um, my friend Bill Eddins uh, had me guest conduct his orchestra up in Edmonton a few years back with Messiah. The librarian I worked with there was so on top of it. And I'd say, you know, a good month or so before, we were making sure the parts were marked yeah. and coordinated, and, uh, you know, it was fantastic. So, of course, I got up at the first rehearsal, and everything was set, and everything was, was there. And it was just about making music. Yeah. Fantastic. So preparing the logistical elements, preparing mm -hmm. the parts making sure your score is in alignment with those parts, uh, not expecting uh, non-traditional things for the players to do without like advance notice, but even then it, you really should make things as straightforward as possible. Oh. Yeah. You should really make things as straightforward as possible. That's it. Oh, that was... Because of Nellie's sound. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. I hello, sc hello. I scared her. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. It's, and it's the see, she's been running around on this paw. Silly girl. It's okay. I've never heard you make that sound before. What was this saying? So I think you were talking about, what, you were talking about score prep? We yeah, ask just about the that, score or? alignment, that's good. Okay, okay so, so what are some of the basic gestural and physical technical concepts that, say, a first-time conductor should prepare before their first rehearsal? Well, I think this goes into just how I teach gestural uh, pedagogy. And some things need to be worked out. Now, by the way, in my teaching, my students get up in front of an ensemble and conduct, and I coach them in front of the ensemble too. You know, many programs do that, and that that's very helpful. I think we have to be I, be careful of suggesting that somehow you do all this preparation, and then there's that magic moment, uh. 
and you stand in front of the ensemble. And, but right, it can't happen because uh, you know this is obvious. The 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 real disadvantage in conducting is you don't have your instrument mm -hmm. uh, to practice on all the time. You have to create an imaginary instrument to practice on. As a violist, I have my my viola sitting right over there in the corner. I can pull it out and practice. I don't have. Uh, <laughs> an orchestra or a chorus or both at my disposal every day to, mm -hmm. to practice. So um, having an opportunity though to practice in front of actual human beings is very important and that's, that's part of the equation. In terms of gestural communication, uh, the very basics what need to happen uh, are a few categories uh, I have, or especially two categories. There are the gestures um, that result in uh, an articulation that as the conductor prepares the gesture and executes the gesture a sound results and that sound will reflect the nature and quality of the gesture so there are two components to the gesture there's the preparation and then there's the stroke that's the ex execution and the preparation is where the conductor conveys you know dynamics uh, mood uh, type of articulation, all the information that uh, the musician needs to be able to execute the sound accordingly is really in that preparation and then the stroke itself follows through so that at the end of that stroke boom there's a sound that's you know think about a downbeat that starts a piece of music. Um, those gestures, those which are basically look like strokes, uh, have to be practiced in in such a way and in a variety of ways so that the musical effects they're asking for can be achieved the second category of second category of gesture that i teach then are gestures of motion and those are the gestures that take you from one articulation to the next and to the next to the next and create a flow of sound um, those gestures tend to be a bit more circular uh, and they have a continuous motion to them that reflects the continuous nature of the music in front of you. Uh, those gestures have to be uh, well worked out and trained. And then, of course, it's using those two categories of gestures together, uh, a combination of these kind of strokes and circular motions. And anyone who studied with Harold Farberman is going to... Uh, you know, recognize some of the same sort of terminology. This, this, a lot of this comes from from him as well, uh, but from others too. It's the combination of strokes and gestures of motion that guide, you know, the entire palette of musical possibility in front of you. And uh, then the third category are these um, sort of clicks or motions in the wrist that cover. Uh, space when something isn't happening. So I use them for dotted rhythms and things like that, where with a click of the wrist, you mark a bit of time after which an articulation happens. So uh, at, the, at the risk of sounding incredibly technical, but it is my pedagogy, strokes, circles, and clicks, and understanding how they all work together and coordinate and can convey basically everything you need to say to a group of musicians to coordinate their own ideas and playing into something that is cohesive and uh, hopefully amazingly expressive. So where do beat patterns fall into that? Beat patterns? <laughs> I uh, asked my leading question. We all yeah, know that this is Maestro Mark Bailey despises beat patterns. Despises is a strong word, although perhaps it's accurate. Um, I think you know. I, I'm going to start this from the other, the other side of the the equation. You use beat patterns when the most important thing to tell a group of musicians is how many beats there are in a measure. Mm -hmm. When that's the most important thing. When that's the critical thing when that supersedes all the other information that you need to convey, or at least has to come before it, then go ahead and use a beat pattern. Um, that's rarely the case, and it's usually, I only find myself having to use it in 
uh, complex 20th century works where it's changing every measure and uh, the length of the pulse is changing and things like that. Um, the thing about beat patterns is when one uses beat patterns, the conductor who, who does so is spending a lot of energy conveying in the most uh, presumed amount of information that is the least important for the orchestra to know or the chorus to know that for instance there are four beats in each measure that's not hard to figure it out figure out and it's rare that's not the most important thing they need to know i will say now here, here's one thing you may not have ever heard me say this when you're when a group is sight reading something and if there's complexity to it i will admit as a player if it's really a tough part, it's good to look up and know, oh, I'm supposed to be on beat four. Um, so maybe when sight reading something that is complex, a few beat patterns to help out every now and then, just to let everyone know where they should be, again, is the important information. That's rarely the case. Uh, and what happens is when a conductor insists on using beat patterns, it gets so boring to look at that you just stop looking. Because if all you're going to do is look up and see the same old pattern, measure after measure after measure, even if it's done in a very eloquent way, but just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, over and over and over again, you stop looking up because you already know that. However, when the gestures are conveying uh, with equal elegance and uh, meaning all sorts of things, you want to pay attention to those gestures when you can't predict what the gesture is necessarily but are able to understand its meaning through whatever combination of strokes circles and clicks you're using it's also worth watching mm -hmm. it's also worth paying attention to i conduct in this manner and i must say i whatever ensemble i'm in front of i rarely have trouble with them watching and responding to what i'm doing um, and that's what I want for my students, too. Well, I think that's quite a bit for a first-time conductor to absorb and digest. Oh, yeah, it is. Do you have any other remarks? Well, we haven't talked about score study. Oh, yet, yes. So we can save that for the next uh, installment. Uh, a term that I don't like, actually. I will use it from time to time, but I think... I don't like it because of its implications. Um, you have, one has to know the music very, very thoroughly, but only part of the music is in the score. Well, we'll save that for next episode. For next time, yes.